thank you all for joining this panel discussion on how to make money with IoT. My name is Rashmi. I am one of the account executives at Particle, and I am joined by our esteemed panelists who will be providing insight on how to have a winning commercial strategy with your IoT devices. And one of the reasons why we decided to add this to the conference is that uh, Particle has had the opportunity to talk to customers, large and small, everyone from emerging startups to Fortune 100 conglomerates. And what we found is, more often than not, it is the business model that will bring an IoT project to a screeching halt and not the technical execution. And so we wanted to talk about things like product design, uh, pricing strategies, and for some of the startups that are out here, how to get investment interest. And so with that, I'd like to make introductions to the panel. Um, you want to start? Sure. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Daniel Burrows, and I'm the founder of Xtreme Trucking. Uh, what we do is we uh, make an active aerodynamic device for trucks, which closes your tractor trailer gap when you're at highway speed to make your truck look more like a bullet train. And we use a particle to uh, track our fuel savings and let our customers know. And in the future, we're putting other products, other connected hardware onto the truck. Um, so we're in market, we're in three fleets of over 10,000 trucks, and we're, uh, we're excited to be on the particle platform. Hi everybody, my name is Kate Whitcomb. Um, I'm now a partner at Hacks, which is the largest investor and accelerator of IoT startups in the world. Uh, we've invested in over 250 teams. Uh, we have offices in Shenzhen, China, so the heart of it all, and here in San Francisco. And I run our efforts in San Francisco on following on with our teams, helping them go to market, sell, fundraise, pitch people like Avidan here, um, and work closely to get our teams to the growth phase. Uh, yeah, and a lot of our uh, startups use the Particle platform. And Hacks was uh, Particle was actually a Hacks team way back in the day. So uh, my name is Avidan Ross. I'm the founder and partner at Root Ventures. So we are a seed stage hard tech fund. Uh, the way we describe it is it's not hard tech as in like just hardware, like hard as in difficult. It just so happens hardware is really, really hard. So half of our portfolio are hardware companies. But we're big believers that technical teams are the future of startups, or at least the startups we care about. Um, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of business model, uh, you know, business model innovations around like the Uber of mustache wax or whatever is coming up next. Uh, but we, we're big believers that. Uh, technical complexity uh, matters. So we have a lot of investments in the IoT space. So we're lucky enough to be investors in Daniel's company. Uh, we were the lead investors in Particle in the seed round, the seed, the pre-seed round, the seed round, and then the lead in the and the lead in the Series A, and then and then we were almost running out of steam, and then we went in big again in the Series B, and uh, we're we're huge believers uh, in Particle, um, and you know have sit through a lot of pitches around ways to build uh, monetization strategies in IoT. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the panel and talking about it. Hey guys, my name is Neil Schultz. I'm co-founder of a company called Alltrack. Uh, we work with farmers to control their hardware. Uh, we use Particle uh, to do that. Uh, so from their phone, farmer can log on, control. Uh, specifically, we focus on outdoor uh, temperature uh, regulation. So it's kind of the nest of farms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, we're, we're starting there, but we believe that farms are going to have a sensor every five acres or less, um, be that for control or monitoring, uh, starting with the frost protection and then working our way from there. And uh, I actually wanted to start with uh, Avidan. I, you were talking about how you'd invested in Particle and then also with Extreme. I'm curious what you've seen change in the industry from when you invested in Particle several years ago to your latest investments. Have you seen any trends or anything interesting that's kind of popped up? That now his investments buy as other investments. So yeah, exactly. money goes from one <laughs> pocket Zach to Zach had less gray hair back then. It's <laughs> yeah. actually true. I, it's, that is true. It is true. It is true. Um, Oh wow, uh, so, was it five five years ago, six years ago? Uh, so much, so much, so much, so much, so much has changed. Um, back then, you know, building a connected product was truly painful. Uh, Zach loves to joke that when I first met him, I had a fistful of microcontrollers in one hand and a fistful of cash in the other because all those microcontrollers I was holding, I had used and they were broken. Right? I was using, you know 
logging in via Telnet to or like over over COM ports to like configure wireless radios. And the idea of building a product was all of this technical effort coming up to just the point where you could show proof of concept. And you know, you you essentially had to roll up your sleeves and spend weeks, if not months, getting to a point of functional before you could start thinking about your business model. And I think nowadays, you know, above and beyond Particle, AWS has stepped in a lot on the cloud side. You have a lot of people up and down the stack. We even believe a lot of it is happening on the non-technical side, right? The sales and marketing engines, being able to use Kickstarter and Indiegogo instead of focus groups. But basically, a lot more can be spent on thinking about the big problem you're solving rather than thinking about the actual minutia steps you're going to take to get there, if that makes sense. Um, so we think, you know, a lot of people are coming in with really, really, really big problems that they want to solve, and they're comfortable with that because all of the baseline has sort of been, you know, you said, like, look, I'm just going to use Particle. I don't, I don't need to answer the question of, like, what microcontroller, what radio, what cellular network, like, how am I actually going to get this thing built? Um, so I think that people are now able to think one step beyond uh, that that first little piece. Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm curious. So that's the technical component of it. And Neil, for you, um, you have a very niche market of addressing farmers. And so, how do you um, how did you guys go about figuring out what the product design would be once you're past the the electronics component of it, but understanding the user profile of a farmer who isn't maybe very technically. I'm going to point out agriculture is so beyond niche. That is like, this guy is like, I've run, uh, we, have a, we have an agriculture investment. And when I saw the TAM, I was like, oh my god. Oh yeah, everybody eats. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and farmers are super technical. You get a farmer talking about CRISPR these days, and you better have like 30 minutes to listen. So just demystifying yeah. farmers. They are. <laughs> technical but skeptical. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, a good way to put it. Uh, yeah, so... Alltrack started in Oregon on a vineyard. Um, Keith Westbrook, uh, co-founder, sitting back there. Um, he worked at his dad's lumber mill for a lot of time and found that you know they automate basically everything there. There's a big PLC, pulls in all the sensor data from all the different machines. Um, and when they started building the vineyard, that equipment either wasn't available or is way too expensive uh, or just didn't work. You know, it was a handful of chips. Um, and so automated basically everything out there, waterworks, um, so irrigation stuff, pumps, valves, flow meters, and then went to doing the frost protection, which is for mainly like grapes, uh, oranges, avocados, like very expensive products that are perennials, so they'll be around for a while, and if they get frost damage, it's really impactful. Um, so we automated those. And then when I came on board, we wanted to bring one of those to market, essentially. Um, and no one was competing in the frost machine uh, space. And so we could kind of get above a lot of the noise. There's a lot of companies out there doing irrigation and everything else. Um, so we went there, and it, it is a niche market. You know, it's uh, you know not huge, but it gives us a toehold. And then from there, we can kind of work our way, work our way down. Um, I would say truck wings is very much a niche market. Um, I'm curious. Yeah, oh, careful, I'm coming on. <laughs> <laughs> I got this one. Rush me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious uh, how you came up with this idea as well. And um, I assume competitively that you guys are in a league of your own. And that's why Avidan invested in you guys. Well, I, I, I drove long haul trucking for about 10 years. Um, no, I've never driven a truck. <laughs> uh, the, the, so when I looked at, so I, I studied uh, uh, climate science, and I was actually looking for a way to reduce carbon emissions. And long haul trucking is eight percent of our total carbon emissions as the United States. Truck wings saves about five percent of fuel. If you put five percent on eight percent, like we're talking about the emissions of Singapore, you can save through um, the truck wings. Um, so it's a small difference, but this is a seven hundred billion dollar industry that's spending a hundred billion dollars on diesel a year. And I just looked at a truck, and I'm like, that doesn't look optimized, like there must be stuff there. Um, and so I put my background in fluid dynamics and uh, I identified the tractor trailer gap. And I was like, okay, so the big market makes sense, but can I like get this truck better? So I worked with, a, with individual trucks and we, the great thing is you put the truck wings on and you drive a track or you drive a stretch of highway, you open them, you shut them and you can see the MPG change. 
Um, so it's a it's a very you can sell it on a cellular level, and then it also makes sense on a bigger level. And there are three million of these trucks out there. So I I I, I guess I started from sort of top down, and then um, and then kind of like you have to solve all the problems bottom up because every fleet owner wants you to solve their problem for their week for their truck that day, and that um, and that was kind of the the, st the story went from like top to micro, and then now it's growing with um, with with big fleets starting to roll us out. So um, before we kind of pivot into talking about the specifics of pricing strategies, because um, we're lucky enough to have two very different pricing strategies and um, go-to-market strategies, I wanted to ask Kate, um, from your, since you have such a large portfolio, if you've seen any interesting trends, because we were talking before we came out here about ag tech, health tech, if you've seen any trends um, across these different industries on how they're trying to go to market and any stories of pitfalls that you can maybe share. Oh, where to start with pitfalls? Um, there's, so, there's so many more stories there. Um, <laughs> I would say the biggest trend that we're seeing from a go-to-market perspective, and I don't want to be too redundant with some of the trends that Avidan talked about, but we're just seeing um, kind of a big movement away from uh, the maker movement, for lack of a better name for it. So we're seeing a lot more teams who have access to more mature technologies that they can deploy quickly to make a product that can be quickly tested to figure out if a customer wants it or not. And from a hardware perspective, that's a lot slower, right? If you talk to somebody who invests in enterprise software, they can um, call 100 people or do a quick market test and figure out what the issues are with that product within, you know, two weeks and quickly change and launch new features and go back to market and try it again. With hardware, it's just a completely different story, so it takes a lot longer. Um, but I think the phase that we're at right now is there's enough available technology that the products people can make fairly quickly are more targeted toward um, the white spaces in the markets. Um, so we're actually seeing a lot of corporate partners come to us now as a hardware investor and saying, do you have something that fits into this space? And we're at the point where we can now say, yeah, we've got five or 10 teams uh, who have done something that will help you with this. And if you want more, we can go out and look in the world and see who else is there. And these are major, you know, Fortune 50 companies. Um, so I think there's a maturation that we've seen as really interesting. Um, I would say the biggest pitfalls we've seen our teams go through is specifically uh, when they get stuck on perfection. Um, and I think Sheryl Sandberg, not to overquote someone who's super overquoted, <laughs> but um, she says done is better than perfect, right? And we tell our teams that constantly. At some point, you need to get something in front of a customer, whether it's perfectly finished or not. And we've seen some of our teams stay in our office in China for months and years because it's cheap, it's fun, there's lots of other founders in our office. Um, I think there's probably a few people in this room who have been there. Um, and it's a nice environment for a maker type. And we need our teams to bring products here, go to market, raise money, meet people like Avidan, and move on with their business to the growth phase. Uh, so there's definitely been, um, there's been a, pr a process towards teams that are further along using technology better and filling a real white space for sure. I would say one thing about the maker, the maker side of things is we've been we've been oscillating a little bit. Like we're we're probably the only, the only major fund. I don't know how else to describe it. Who's who's at Maker Fair every year, uh, and and has multiple investments. So we were in Shaper Tools, which is the handheld CNC router. Obviously, we're in Particle. We have we have investments that are there, and people are always like, "Oh, you're the Maker Pro investors, right? Like you invest and you make makers become professionals." And we actually flip it and we say, "No." What we do is we're seed investors, and we like funding people who do a lot with a little. And it just so happens, makers are people who do a lot with a little. And that that mindset is very important, right? And so despite not, you know, like anyone who comes to us and pitches us that they like built something on a Raspberry Pi, we're like, ah, oh, you know that doesn't scale, right? Like the supply chain's terrible, like we're not gonna get into that. But, but we still believe that the maker communities yield a lot of really fantastic entrepreneurs. It's just that the the difference between thinking what you do um, in your sort of making and what you're building for Maker Faire, it, it just becomes commercializable when you go to Hacks and you show up in China and you're like, here's the thing I made as a maker and like, can we now scale this? It's like, whoa, let's stop. Let's take a step back and talk about the problem you're trying to solve and how you know a program like Hacks can actually bring you closer to it. So that's how we, we sort of think through the maker um, the maker audience. And we'll take credit for being the ones who advised uh, Zach in the first place to maybe consider moving away from the light bulb idea and into a platform idea. But maybe Avidan will take credit. It's hard to say who will steal the Oh, no, I passed that. on the light bulb. I didn't give him advice. I just said no. <laughs> we can get Zach up here to debate who gets any credit for your genius. 
Um, I would say that Neil, um, you and Heath actually exemplify doing a lot with the little and you guys have a very unique business model that maybe has also allowed you to not have to go to investors yet and, and uh, do it on your own. So I'd love for you to be able to share how you guys came up with that business model. A lot of it has to do with the downtime and, and the ROI savings that your farmers are using that allows you to do that. So if you can explain um, that, that would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, our pricing model... We got a lot of feedback early on of people just not buying stuff, um, <laughs> which is pretty instructive. Uh, but you know, Heath had done some consulting work, so we had some seed funding, uh, which gave us air cover for about a year, um, enough time to really get our you know feet on the ground. And the farmers, the consistent feedback we got with farmers in the U.S. is that you know they're happy to spend half a million dollars on a tractor but they just can't swallow giving you, you know, $100 a year in perpetuity for a cellular service, right? And so they just want to do a CapEx and then write it off. Uh, and, and that's where we see ourselves. Like, you have, a, you have a wind machine every 10 acres, so there's certain customers in California that have thousands of these, um, which, you know, is, that's a lot of tractors. Um, and we're selling them tractors, but we're selling them you know, a thousand bucks at a time. So instead of selling them um, the hardware at a fixed cost and then doing a subscription fee, we basically take the subscription fee and bundle that into the cost of the device. Um, and they're able to, you know, just buy it, write it off, however they want to do it. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it actually points out, like, raising venture capital, we're all in Silicon Valley and everyone's like, oh, did you raise venture money? And the truth of the matter is, is like in hardware and IoT, and actually in a lot of products, venture is not the answer. And I know that's weird for a VC to be standing here saying, it's like, it's totally not the answer. Because you have a good business, you're making margins every time you sell, your cash flow is probably fantastic because you're getting paid up front, even though you end up having to pay Particle over time, right? Particle's not charging you two years worth of data services, but you're baking that into your initial cost. So like cash management works out really nicely when you have a business like that. The way that VCs think about the business models is we're thinking like, can you go like this, right? And that's not normal, right? You actually walk down the aisles of like Target, Best Buy, Walmart. Most of that stuff is not venture backable in any way, shape or form, because like if you want to 2X your revenue the next year, well, you need to either double the number of sales or cut your bomb in half, right? right? And like, neither of those things are likely gonna happen. So most of the time, the reason why IOT has gotten venture interest is specifically because there's a software services layer, and I'm sure we'll get into it even deeper, but like most just physical products that you sell that are, that are margin driven, the truth of the matter is if you measured yourself on a VC's ability to like fund it, you'd be, mis you'd be measuring against the wrong thing because the business model just doesn't line up. So I, I honestly like having a profitable business that's selling a product at a margin is actually, or, I mean, right. that, that's the ultimate. Yeah, having and we're, sale. You know, we're, we're looking for base hits really, yep. right? Like we don't need a shot of adrenaline and swing for the fence on what's really like a 20 million a year opportunity. Like it's not that huge for these wind machines. Um, I think where it does get interesting is like you get a couple base hits and then you can start, you know, looking at larger industries. So irrigation, that's a multi-billion dollar industry, right? And like once we write this playbook, once we figure out what we're doing, get every single thing lined up, then, you know, we can go somewhere else and iterate really quickly and spin that. And then at that point, then you reevaluate if you do want funding or not. I do think that your, the Alteric business model is very specific to the way that farmers have a appetite to, to purchase, but more often than not, most of our customers are going to market with the subscription model, and I think um, that's what Extreme is looking to do as well, and I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you guys develop that approach, especially with the savings. Yeah, so... Um... <clears throat> Our, our device is pretty expensive. It's like five thousand dollars or so, um, and so we we also for the the data stream we we try and bake that into the upfront cost. But then I think what you can price on is what you're delivering on in terms of value, right? Like they'll pay for the value. So if you can find so, so the first product is the truck wings, which is a piece of hardware which they're buying. But really, um, what we're looking to build is 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 ongoing 
data stream or other connected sensors for them, which, which delivers value beyond the truck wings. Um, and that is uh, uh, parking sensors, that is reefer temperatures, that is tire pressure monitoring, that is engine diagnostics, that is we are on the CAN bus, so we know all the... So, so those things are ongoing value that you can deliver, and therefore you can charge monthly for them. But if you're not changing something or giving them something new every month, it's very hard to say, that, you know the truck wings you bought two years ago? Here's your next monthly payment for it. Um, and I think that that, uh, so, uh, and, and, uh, so I think that also understanding that they have a lot of capital, um, so it is cheap for them to pay up front, and that actually works for our cash conversion cycle as well. Because um, that's something that if their cost of capital is 2 or 3%, my cost of capital as a venture-backed company is like 30%, 40%, whatever it is, um, more than that probably. Um, <laughs> Lucky Abaddon. Um, the um, you know you, you want to you want to make sure that you're that you that's actually something you want to give give on. If you can bring cash forward in your sales cycle with your enterprise customers, that's that's a, that's a good thing for a startup as well. You fund yourself off your customers if you can. Yeah, um, Kate, I I'm curious because uh, not all not all companies are successful like uh, Extreme and Altrek. In your mind, does a company that comes to you, do they have to prove out their business model before they come to you? Or um, are you willing to guide them if you think the idea is good enough? Yeah, at the seed, at the seed stage, there'd be almost no way for them to prove it out. Um, so for us, a lot of the times we're relying on gut and information we already know about the industry. Um, but a lot of the times, the teams that we're investing in, and I'm sure, I think from Avidan's portfolio, he's most of the time in the same boat, um, it's it's kind of guesswork, and you think about what the team's doing, and if it's truly disruptive, um, their business model could be totally untested. Uh, for us, for example, we're oftentimes looking for teams where we see their five-year plan is potentially being vertically integrated, or 10-year plan. Five-year might be ambitious. But we're looking for teams where they're selling a product that they can treat as a beachhead to offer a larger service within a certain type of organization, and then they can eventually vertically integrate and be the provider for an entire industry. For example, we just made an investment in a team called Shape Measure that does um, automatic floor measurements for wood and laminate flooring, and then they feed that information back to a flooring provider. So what you think of now is like a showroom where they have an automatic cutting machine that will cut those measurements. So less weight, five times less manpower, huge, huge advantage in this field because human costs are a huge part of construction costs. Uh, and for them, for example, their long-term play is absolutely vertically integrating the flooring business. So their initial customers might even be a little bit trepidatious around saying yes, thinking about what happens next. Are you going to buy us in 10 years? And we're seeing dollar bill signs like, yes, you should absolutely do that at some point. Um, but we have to see into the future and think what is next for this business. And if it's that kind of return, that's where the hockey stick comes in. And that's a VC investable business. So for us, that's interesting. Whereas just like Avidan was saying, with a typical consumer play, in most cases, there just isn't that type of manipulation of data and vertical integration where it's worth that long run approach and that long term partnership. Yeah. We're, we're seeing that startup tomorrow. So thank you for sending yeah. that. That was actually a pitch to Avi then. Yeah. That was effective. We're, we're, we're seeing them tomorrow. So we'll, we'll see if that all holds water. It's a good pitch. Yeah, it's yeah, a good yeah, pitch. Good I, I, like, I mean, okay. like, now that, that I heard that it, I was like, huh, Kate, I'd good. fund you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll let the team know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think what's interesting is that a lot of times we look at connectivity as a uh, Trojan horse, right? Like fundamentally, we've had microcontrollers that can make intelligent decisions. So what does connectivity really do? Why, why, why does particle matter, right? Like why did we get interested about particle? And truthfully, we got excited about particle because of what it unlocked as, as possibilities and opportunities for the next businesses, right? And so we think of it a lot as a closed loop system, right? The idea being that you're, you're loading sensors up all over the world, collecting tons of information. And like previously, you would take that information and make a decision. But now you have connectivity. Now you're in the cloud or you're connecting to you know, remote but nearby objects via mesh. And you're pushing it into the cloud and then making really intelligent decisions because you're interconnecting to you know, weather data or prediction or you, you have interconnectivity to an ML engine or whatever it might be. And now with rules engine, you can literally put it together with like point and click. Any of the business analysts at any of these companies are able to put together these really complex decision-making processes that are connecting to data streams that were otherwise untouchable. And now you can push that information back down to a low-cost actuator or a hyper 
like capable actuator. So we, we look at all of this as, you know, the peace dividends of the smartphone wars, the peace dividends of now the autonomous car wars, because now you're able to pull in camera information and LIDAR information, and you have high-speed actuators, and you have all of these things, but that connectivity layer is what's supremely important, because you will never have enough information at the edge to make the ideal decision. You might be able to make the fastest decision at the edge, but truly connectivity is always going to give you more information. And what that, un what that unlocks are entirely new business opportunities because then you're presenting to that customer a real reason to pay you monthly because month after month after month, you're making better decisions for them because your data is going to get better, you have more accumulated information, and you're building an even wider moat around your business. So for us, connectivity is sort of table stakes. At the, if you're building a hardware product and you don't have connectivity, we're not interested, right? You might make like something that's beautiful, high design, and you're going to build a great brand around it, and you might make a lot of money, but our thesis drives a lot around that moat that you build and the business models you're able to build layered on top of connectivity. Yeah, I actually wanted to go back to one thing Kate had talked about, which is the vertical integration. And I'm curious, um, as you're talking about the next layer after the Trojan horse, what do you think about vertical integration with um, governments where they're providing subsidies and rebates and insurance companies that are looking at solutions like Opti for reinsurance? I'm curious what your thoughts are there. And actually, we, we have had a couple teams go after the subsidy idea, primarily in the consumer space. And one of the issues is that the amount of uh, savings you need to provide to like a mun municipality has to be so high in order to qualify for subsidies. It's just hard for a smaller sage company to um, take advantage of that as part of their launch business model. Yeah. So that's just uh, from the seed stage perspective. Or I should say pre-seed stage. Daniel, you were going to say something. Uh, yeah, so, so we, we, um, we looked at some of these things. We won about half a million dollars early on in DOE grants and things. And we, we, we stopped doing that because uh, I think the, it, 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 if you're not careful, it takes your eyes off the prize, which is like a product that works for your customers that they want to pay for. And you start doing stuff for other, for other people for other reasons. And even though inherent in the team is this carbon savings and we love talking about internally, our customers don't care. You know, they, they want to, you know, and they've got to run their business and they're making two... Three to four percent net income, and they they want to make you know one percent more net income, and that's what Truck Wings does for them. So, I think that we you know we we've moved away from that business model. But but on the on the sort of the concept of this like connectivity, we're used to like silicon, like getting you know uh, every year on year halving in price, uh, eighteen months, of, uh, and 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 data costs going through the floor. But there's actually something that which being on Particle, which has been a, a different trend for us, which is that. Uh, the features are getting more and more every 18 months. So, you know, we launched without the mesh, and now the mesh is being announced. And so we're going to build more things onto it, and that's going to give, for us, a business model where the moat increases over time, and we can give more to our customers based off the, um, based off the platform we're on. So it's, it's rather than costs coming down over time, being on Particle is giving us more features over time to offer to our customers, and that gives us a different set of defensive mechanisms and increasing pricing power. So it's kind of a it's kind of a, a different type of price curve, but it's a, a functionality increasing curve, which is a cool thing to be riding as a as a as, as a, a in in the trucking space when there's there's so many decisions that are being made with very little data, and and uh, we can do we can we can get that data into the decisions engine into the rules based engine and uh, let our customers decide what they want to do with their data, which is which is freeing it from the sort of confines of the truck and putting it into the cloud where they can access it. I actually have a vertical integration question for you, because this is, in the, in the farm world, we, we invested in a company, so we think of vertical integration a little bit differently the way you described it. We think of it like, we invested in a hamburger making robot, but instead of selling that robot to McDonald's, they opened a restaurant around the corner. And they are going directly after McDonald's saying, we're going to be the whole restaurant, not just a piece of equipment, right? Like today, your customer is the farm. So we invested in a robot that picks specialty produce off of vines, and it's a robot that goes up and down the rows. And someone recently said to me, he said, well, why, why not just become the farm, right? Like, if you're doing all this work, what is the farmer really providing? And your, you're actually, like, in, in the weeds, I'm sorry. You're, you're, uh, you're in it. Like, when you think about all tracks, like, super long-term goal, if you're doing the irrigation, you're doing the like all the management of stuff, what is the farmer actually doing? And should you at that point just say like, hey, let me, let me off, I'm running your farm end to end. Why not be more, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, 
the farmer is essentially a land holding company that also owns the water under the ground. So a lot of the large companies out there, like uh, you could look at Wonderful Citrus, for example, um, they started, you know, uh, he just looked for a place to park his money out in San Joaquin Valley, right? And now he owns basically the entire water bank for the San Joaquin Valley down there. And he can get water in and then sell it out at whatever he wants, essentially. Um, so a lot of these companies like, and that are really, that are large companies, the publicly traded companies or privately held and worth billions of dollars, um, their, their value, most of their value is in the land. And then they're extremely sophisticated with the technology that they deploy. Um, and they're, they're our early adopters for basically all our technology. So Avan and I just came from our board meeting and uh, actually I need to update a couple of slides. I've got a new business plan. <laughs> I'm gonna buy a thousand trucks. You'll get the capital cool tomorrow. <laughs> they're only about 200K each, they'll be fine. Good answer. Uh, I'll, send, I'll send the term sheet over tonight. <laughs> I was actually, um, when I wasn't thinking about vertical integration, but Neil and Daniel, it's interesting when Jacuzzi was speaking earlier today, they have the data to be able to address multiple different end users. You have the customer, you have the distributor, and right now, um, Neil, I think right now you're just talking to the farmer, but eventually you can give the data on the machine to the manufacturer. Similarly for so for Daniel, and so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what your phase two might look like one day. Yeah, they're super interested because these trucks. Um, if you're if you're a tier one or you're an OEM, uh, you actually don't get a lot of data back. So we're right now in some pretty interesting partnership discussions with people who want to understand how is their hardware working out in the field. And these are big companies that you would have heard of that have no idea apart from some patchy warranty information back from the fleets. And so it's. Uh, it, and you can tell them a lot about how their engine, tires, transmission actually are performing on the field. Um, and this data is stuff that's, uh, that's out there, but it's stuck on the truck. And, uh, and we, can, we can get that back to them in a way that, um, especially as we're starting to roll out in some of the bigger fleets, we have enough critical mass of data that it starts to be meaningful for their, for their own development programs. So one of them is interested in doing that right now. So we're, you know, it's, it's, it's a Trojan horse. Get the truck wings out there, get a ton of these carbon connects, what we call our, our companies carbon connect, and then, um, and then the, the, the business models come after that are, are, are pretty clear and, self, and they write themselves in many ways. Yeah. And just, just to add on to that, um, what we ran into early in this process of working with distributors and manufacturers of these frost fans is we went into it thinking that our product was complete. You know, the customer loves it. They say, this is simple. I can't live without this. You go to the distributor, and they're like, what the hell is this thing? You know, like, I, d I didn't ask for this. You know, I don't want this. And so we really had to build a completely separate product. Like in that jacuzzi presentation, you probably saw that, right? Like they have the, the UI, the fancy UI for the customer, which you can adjust your LEDs and your temperature and whatnot. And then there's a completely different portal for the distributor. And when you're thinking about it, you need to think about it as two separate products. And you need to engage those people as early as possible. Because we've been talking with distributors for literally years. Um, and they're, they're all coming around. But it's just to retrain them, get them the marketing material, retrain the sales guys, get them a smartphone if they don't have it. Like, you know, you have to spend time doing all these things. If you can figure a way to make distributors a lot of money, that gets their attention. Yeah. It's really, yeah. and, and they will become the best customer support, sales support. Um, if you're any kind of franchise model, if you can make the, the people in this chain really worth their while, like not try and cut them down, find other places to make your product cheaper, and then things go a lot smoother. I, I think the yeah. tough part is you have to tell them that their business model is going to change. Because currently, they're selling a thing and they're just trying to move it out the door. And by definition, we work on a monthly, right? I mean, you guys were able to, you guys sort of like met them where they were and said, look, I'll just charge a lot more for it up front. But I think the real difficulty is with a lot of companies that don't have that luxury of charging, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 for whatever it is up front, but instead have to turn to a distrib distributor and say, distribute my thing that I charge $100 a month for, and I will give you a cut of that $100 a month. 
and the distributor's like, so how much are you going to pay me today? And, then, and you're like, no, 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 every month. They're like, no, no, today. Like, when I move product, I get paid. And you have to change, you have to change their mindset. You have to say like, well, wouldn't you really love to like have like recurring revenue over time and like it'll stack and they're just like, it ain't my business. <laughs> it just, and, 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 and it's right, it's not their business. So oftentimes you're holding the bag because you're basically saying, oh, well, it's a three year contract and so like I'm gonna look at it forward and roll it all up and give you a cut on it and it's out of your pocket that you're paying the distributor. So I think it's looking at distributors and trying to treat them as partners and sell them on your mission, saying like, look, this is what we're building together. It's, it, it, it pays for itself if you can get them over that. But I think at the end of the day, you're right. It's like, show them the money and figure out that they can, they can make more money out of it. You guys have a lot of consumer, consumer stuff, but you've been doing a lot of enterprise of recent. How are you seeing, like, what, what's your shift? Uh, kind of exactly what you guys have been saying. I mean, consumer is easy because you're selling a widget into a supply chain and you're saying, uh, I want X thousand number of units to be bought and sold, and that's exactly how they transact. There's no need for a subscription. If anything, most of the apps with consumer tech products um, basically have a freemium model where people can upgrade, but they literally never do. So there's no long-term revenue stream for most of those products. So it's just more straightforward. Um, but from an industrial, enterprise, and health perspective, exactly how you guys described it is what we're seeing, particularly with uh, the lower willingness of less sophisticated purchasers to follow a subscription. Um, for example, we have a, uh, a headset that's used for neurorehabilitation right now that we just invested in, and it uses near-infrared spectroscopy to look at how the brain is uh, responding to certain movements that a stroke patient will do during rehab. Uh, and that information currently isn't available. So people will do these movements during rehab with no idea if they're affecting the right part of the brain to aid in the rehab. Um, and this headset uh, will use data real time. It will have a cost to the producer to, to keep uh, on and active and transmitting data, but there's no way to sell to physiologists a product that they'll have to pay a subscription for because they've never done that before. So they'll have to take partnerships with hospitals, with uh, people who sell in to these clinics, um, and in most cases charge an upfront fee uh, that includes the data for one year, two years, or whatever makes sense, and then kind of call on them later and potentially consider a leasing model. But exactly what you guys are saying, just working with um, how that person is traditionally used to thinking about payment models mm -hmm. and not trying to change that 100% in the first try. That, that, that's it. One year free, get them addicted, and then start charging them is a really good model. And stay close, give them great data, provide great reporting, make it then, a relationship. Then they don't have to without. believe you. Then they know what it's doing. And I think that that really helps is show me how this affects my business, how it, how it can be better. And then after a year, start paying monthly. And if it doesn't work out for them, then they, you know, there's no, no, it wouldn't have worked out anyway. <laughs> I want to be uh, mindful of time. I see a lot of nodding heads, and we have about 10 minutes left for questions. So I wanted to open it up to the audience to see if there are any questions for our panel. Yes. Uh, hello. My name is Greg Wright. Uh, firstly, Hacks, huge fan. <laughs> you guys have such a sensational operation. Thank you very much. Um, question is, uh, have you ever done around the dockless rideshare scooter <laughs> sort of blow up that we're seeing this year, removing the fact that Particle was actually involved in the electron and so on in there. Two questions, one of them being, what do you think of that as a business model looking at it from an IoT to consumer point? And secondarily, from an investment point of view, do you think that they've all taken too much cash? Do you think they've taken the correct amount of cash? I think they need to take more cash. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty sure. They can get uh, all the cash. So. <laughs> oh my God, that's so loaded. Here we go, ready? Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so it's only possible today because of IoT, right? Like fundamentally, if you look at every single dock, dockless program, ride sharing in general only works because of ubiquitous connectivity. So uh, the scooters are able to get out into market and be able to roll around because we have low cost microcontrollers with easy connectivity that run on batteries and aren't required to like have a smartphone plugged in and can run for an entire day, right? Batteries already built in because you're electric, beautiful, it's all really tightly integrated. Um, the, the world of using the product, has, any, has everyone written, a, who has not gotten to ride a, okay, oh, wow. you are much safer as a human <laughs> being having not ridden on one of these things. That being said, they're awesome. <laughs> it's so much fun. Like, literally, you, you're like foolish and childish and you're totally 
to, like not wearing a helmet and you're like <laughs> going 20 miles down there. You're like in the bike lane. Oh pissing yeah, sure bikers. you are. Pissing off everyone. Stay off the sidewalk. Just don't ride on the sidewalk, please. Um, and 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 it and it is really like it's amazing. We're 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 partially all kids inside, but we also like really want to get somewhere a little bit faster. And traffic is terrible and everywhere you want to get around traffic is terrible and people want to do these short rides. So there's clearly a market for it. People want it. I'm not going to talk about how dangerous and irresponsible it is because it is very dangerous and irresponsible, but it's a touch on what people want in the future, which is a very low touch way of like not walking. Um, <laughs> We're lazy. I like really like we are so lazy. It's ridiculous. Now, how much money is being raised is a very loaded question because the argument of why so why are any of them going to win? When you ride a scooter around town, it, you're riding like one might argue you're riding because you see a scooter in front of you. Hence the argument of raise a ton of money and just dump scooters in front of everybody's house. So they'll see it, they'll download the app, really low friction, App Store makes make it super easy to onboard. That's one argument. The other is you're already opening an app that demonstrates your intent to go somewhere. So you open up Uber, you open up Lyft, and you say, I want to go to my office, or I want to go to the store. Uber and Lyft's problem is that people today don't open that app for something they're gonna walk to. They already make the decision, like this is so far I need to get in four wheels. So the opportunity that all the scooter folks are basically trying to exploit is that the consumer, Uber and Lyft are saying, no, 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 they're gonna open the app every time they wanna go anywhere. And that's like not true. So they need to change, Uber and Lyft's job is to change people's mindset to open the app even for the shortest rides. And therefore that's why they're pushing their scooter programs. The reason why you're getting a ton of money being funneled into all these scooter companies that has to happen is because you need to literally bombard people with scooters in front of them at all times for them to realize they are a sucker for walking. And that's basically the, the program. So I think they're, they, they're, they're raising the right amount of money because the battle that they have is basically coming at Uber, Uber and Lyft coming from the top and changing the way people use the app and they need to literally just be in front of everyone's face and it's only 500 bucks a pop so they can do it. Does that answer the question? That's great. All right. Yeah, great. I'm not an investor in any of those companies because it's crazy town. It's like totally crazy town. It is like you are just burning so much cash to, at the end of the day, Uber and Lyft might figure it out. So like I'm good with like crazy venture investing. I'm not good with like it's, 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 it's too much even for me. And I'm like a very risky investor. So uh, I'm not an investor in any of them, but we have a lot of friends in the industry and God bless them. <laughs> we were investors in jump bikes, so I certainly can't complain on behalf of Hacks and SOSV. So take one of those orange bikes if you see one on the street. Remember hacks. <laughs> Any other questions? Zach, I see your hand up. No. <laughs> what's, uh, what's a business model that, that was presented to you that you didn't think would ever work and then turned out it did? That's a good question. Oh, selling doorbells. Oh, doorbells. Oh my God, he like pitched me this doorbell idea and I was like, what? why would someone pay monthly for their doorbell? <laughs> and it was like, um, it, it also the, the, I mean, Jamie has now made a ton of money so I can say it. It was a piece of crap. Like doorbot, like, like it took like four minutes from pressing the doorbell to like it showing up on your phone and like the person left by then. It was like so ridiculous. It was so outrageous. And and it was brilliant at the same time because no one had coverage of the, the video was important. It was like that fear of missing out, the fear of losing a package, the fear of not knowing someone was at your door, whether you were home or away. And he figured it out. And I, and I, I, I honestly like, he gives me shit about it every time I see it. Cause I like did not believe at all. And that business model, it wasn't right. You're, you're, you, you are able to charge people monthly, even if it doesn't seem obvious that you're able to. And, and he took a lot of cues from Dropcam, which I think was very smart, and was able to apply it to the doorbell. So that was sort of like eye-opening. But I have some others that are in the back of my head somewhere. But that's the one that, that's my billion-dollar miss. 
On a much smaller, less interesting health tech related scale, I would say a super frequent business model that gets pitched is um, a health tech related uh, product that involves a very simple consumable. So a super advanced product that might do some sort of imaging or some sort of infield diagnostics of some sort. And then their entire subscription business model will be like an adhesive pad that you pay $2 a day for or something, but that's what there's a predicate payer code for. So that's what they can raise VC money for because the product itself um, will take five years before a code is developed or might not ever get a code uh, for health insurance reimbursement. Um, so there's this less flashy underbelly that's like cotton products, uh, adhesive strips, whatever might have to do with using that product on a daily basis with patients. So l way less exciting than a ring exit to Amazon, but uh, super relevant and we see all the time. Um, on the flip side, we do see a lot of companies who pitch us products that then they say, and there's a subscription model, and then they'll just say anything next. <laughs> It'll be like, and you pay five, $5 a month for this red LED light to turn on. And you're like, did you just make that up? Because I asked you if there was any recurring revenue. And that happens every single day of my life. <laughs> any other questions before we wrap up? Yeah, there's one. Uh, I'm a climate scientist. I think the the biggest one I see, I mean, we're in California, so I'll speak to California, but, you know, a lot of it has to do with water nowadays. Um, so there's regulation going in in the next 10 to 15 years, which is a long time. Um, but farmers are already starting to shift uh, their practices today. And that's something that I think anyone can get behind that, you know, if you... If you want to save the salmon in the delta, or you don't, you know, like you can get behind saving water. I would just broaden from trucking to transportation more generally. I think that um, it's about a third of our carbon emissions is transportation, and when, by, by different def, def, uh, different estimates, 20 to 25 percent of trucks are empty on the road. Um, uh, ship containers are moving stuff one direction and the same stuff the other direction, or you know, it, there's, it, it, there, people still do point and spoke distribution models because of the challenge of data and routing things correctly. And I think that uh, particle-like opportunities on uh, to, to go direct to store, direct to consumer, and void distribution centers can can be hugely more efficient. Um, so I would I would I would keep looking in in transportation and logistics because uh, the you can prove the savings so conclusively, and then, and then it's a spreadsheet sale. Like we, our sales process, we send a spreadsheet of insert your number of trucks, we'll sh show you the fuel savings, and then you can sell a lot of units that way. So I, I, would, I, I would keep looking in transportation because if you look at trains and you look at ships and you look at uh, trucks, uh, there's a lot of uh, ways that those could be optimized on the ground, um, because data only only matters if you can change the direction of travel or something or change a decision. And I think that in transportation, the, the ease of changing those decisions on the ground is, is much, is, is just just a, a, a left or right turn away. Uh, so I, I think that it, um, I, I would keep looking at transportation. So I, I, I've been told by my wife I optimize too much. Um, and that's because I'm an engineer. Engineers optimize, right? That's, you're always looking, there's got to be a better way. That's my answer for everything, even though I oftentimes don't find the answer, but that's the, that's the mental mindset. And I think that uh, we've been called a clean tech fund, even though we have, we're not a clean tech fund, because so many of our investments are optimizations. So I'll tell you another one in the transportation, and this is actually leads to a funny story, uh, but we are invested in a company that builds black boxes for like huge ships, like huge, like the freaking oil tankers and like cart container ships, massive. And all they do is they read all the data coming off the ship and they give a report that shows like, hey, here's how all of the equipment on the ship was run. Here's the RPM of the main engine and the speed and all that good stuff. So you could see all your ships on a map and like see the performance data. Um, and the idea long term is to, to optimize it and like be the nest 
of ships. Hey, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so when they first deployed it on ships, all these ships thought they were optimized because they had a captain. And the captain's responsibility was to make sure that like, the ship was running well. And the, the first deployment they had, they got a phone call from the owners of the ship, and they said, your system is broken. It says that the RPM of the ship is dropping by 20% for seven hours straight and then lifting back up and doing that every single day. And if that's true, we're burning $200,000 of bunker fuel extra a year. Your system's broken. And so they finally like hem and haw, they look at the logs, they call the captain on a satellite phone in the middle of the Pacific. And they're like, hey, can you check the wire? It says the RPM's dropping by 20 RPM every single night. And the guy says, well, I could check it, but like, I know it's right. And they're like, what do you mean? He goes, I'm turning it down. And they're like, why the hell are you turning down the main engine? And he says, it's quieter so I could sleep. <laughs> like, that's what's going on. And not to say that that's like the main reason for climate change, but we had no idea. We, it could be that all the captains are just like turning down the engine and that's why we got a hole in the ozone layer. If, it, it, yeah. <laughs> it, it, if I've learned one thing from trucking is like what happens on the truck in the middle of the United States versus what, hap what people think is happening to the truck when they're sitting in the boardroom talking about their trucks and their deployments, it's miles apart. And when you, when you actually spend time on the road talking to the captain, talking to the driver, these business opportunities are very, so I, I would say, once again, focus back on the micro level and you know, ask the captain why he couldn't get some noise canceling headphones. We bought him earplugs. <laughs> we bought him earplugs and we fired him. No. <laughs> um, I wanna thank you guys all for joining. Please give a round of applause for thank you. And, uh, I'm, uh, and we're hiring, so please come see me. <laughs> thank you everyone.